Good evening and welcome to Evening Prayer for Monday, July 20th. Today is the day the Lutheran Church commemorates the prophet Elijah. So we will hear a little bit about him. Let's begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense. The lifting up of my hands is the evening sacrifice. Joyous light of glory of the immortal Father, heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ, we have come to the setting of the sun, and we look to the evening light. We sing to God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life, the universe proclaims your glory. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. Praise to you, O Christ. O come, let us worship him. Lord Jesus, stay with us, for the evening is at hand and the day is past. Be our constant companion on the way. Kindle our hearts and awaken hope among us, that we may recognize you as you are revealed in the scriptures and in the breaking of the bread. Grant this for your name's sake. Amen. The Lord is my portion. I promise to keep your words. I entreat your favor with all my heart. Be gracious to me according to your promise. When I think on my ways, I turn my feet to your testimonies. I hasten and do not delay to keep your commandments. Though the cords of the wicked ensnare me, I do not forget your law. At midnight I rise to praise you because of your righteous rules. I am a companion of all who fear you, of those who keep your precepts. The earth, O Lord, is full of your steadfast love. Teach me your statutes. Our New Testament reading today is from the book of Acts, chapter 16. Paul came also to Derba and to Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the bro brothers at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places for they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they went there on their way through the cities, they delivered to them for observance the decisions that had been reached by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in the faith, and they increased in numbers daily. And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they had come up to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So, passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there, urging him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go on into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So, setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace and the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia, and a Roman colony. We remained in this city some days, and on the Sabbath day we went outside the gate to the riverside, where we were supposed where we supposed that there was a place of prayer, and we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, who was a worshipper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized in her household as well, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. As we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune-telling. She, she followed Paul and us, crying out, these men are servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her, and to came out that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, These men are Jews, and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. 
The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates tore the garments off of them and gave orders to beat them with rods. Our uh, small called article reading will be articles 12, 13, 14, and 15, which will conclude the small called articles. But first, a few words about the prophet Elijah. The prophet Elijah, whose name means, My God is Yahweh the Lord, prophesied in the northern kingdom of Israel, primarily during the reign of Ahab, 874-853 B.C. Ahab, under the influence of his pagan wife Jezebel, had encouraged the worship of Baal throughout his kingdom, even as Jezebel sought to get rid of the worship of Yahweh. Elijah was called by God to denounce this idolatry and to call the people of Israel back to the worship of Yahweh as the only true God as he did in 1 Kings 18. Elijah was a rugged and imposing figure, living in the wilderness and dressing in a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt. See 2 Kings 1. He was a prophet mighty in word and deed. Many miracles were done through Elijah, including the raising of the dead, 1 Kings 17, and the effecting of a long drought in Israel. At the end of his ministry, he was taken up into heaven while Elisha, his successor, looked on, 2 Kings 2. Later, the prophet Malachi proclaimed that Elijah would return before the coming of the Messiah, Malachi 4, a prophecy that was fulfilled in the prophetic ministry of John the Baptist, Matthew 11. The small called articles, article 12, the church. We do not agree with them, being the Roman Catholic Church, that they are the church, they are not the church, nor will we listen to those things that, under the name of church, they command or forbid. Thank God today a seven-year-old child knows what the church is, namely the holy believers and lambs who hear the voice of their shepherd, John 10, 11 to 16. For the children pray, I believe in one holy Christian church. This holiness does not come from albs, tonsures, long gowns, and other ceremonies they made up without holy scripture but from God's word and true faith. Article 13, how one is justified before God and does good works. I do not know how to change in the least what I have previously and constantly taught about justification. Namely, that through faith, as St. Peter says, we have a new and clean heart, Acts 15. And God will and does account us entirely righteous and holy for the sake of Christ our mediator. 1 Timothy 2.5. Although sin in the flesh has not yet been completely removed or become dead, Romans 7.18, yet he will not punish or remember it. Such faith, renewal, and forgiveness of sins are followed by good works, Ephesians 2. What is still sinful or imperfect in them will not be counted as sin or defect for Christ's sake, Psalm 32, Romans 4. The entire individual, both his person and his works, is declared to be righteous and holy from pure grace and mercy, shed upon us and spread over us in Christ. Therefore we cannot boast of many merits and works, if they are viewed apart from grace and mercy. As it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 1.31 Namely, that he has a gracious God. For with that, all is well. We say, besides, that if good works do not follow, the faith is false and not true. Article 14, Monastic Vows. Since monastic vows directly conflict with the first chief article, they must be absolutely abolished. It is about them that Christ says, Many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. He who makes a vow to live as a monk believes that he will enter upon a way of life holier than ordinary Christians lead. He wants to earn heaven by his own works, not only for himself, but also for others. This is to deny Christ. They also boast from their St. Thomas Aquinas that a monastic vow is equal to baptism. This is blasphemy. Just a little aside about monastic traditions. I don't think they really have Roman Catholic monks anymore, uh, although they do have uh, nuns. However, in the Eastern Orthodox Church, uh, they still have uh, men who become hermits and, and live, other men that, that vow to live in monasteries. And they actually do believe uh, that, that through their holiness and through their pious actions and prayer, that they are actually uh, holding evil at bay in the world. 
uh, and they believe that uh, that through their prayer uh, they actually have good works to spare so by cutting themselves off for the world and praying for the world they're doing good for the world by uh, keeping the devil at bay and uh, keeping the earth from from descending into pure uh, chaos and there's a, a mountain in uh, Greece uh, still to this day called Mount Athos and you can watch videos about it and there's books written about it and there are monasteries uh, still there and literally the higher you go up the mountain uh, the stranger and more uh, hermetic the uh, people get and so you actually have guys on like the top of the mountain who live by themselves in a cave and don't talk to anybody and a fellow went to do a uh, kind of a documentary about them and so he went up to the top and met one of the hermits and the hermit shows him to his own cave and he spent like 30 days up there uh, all by himself uh, in prayer and the, the monk told him kind of how to do it and uh, he had enough provisions to last and he said by the end of the 30 days he was literally going crazy he was starting to see things um, and it was very very strange he thinks he had uh, spiritual experiences, but he thinks he was more being assaulted by the devil uh, because his mind had nothing to do other than turn on itself and be self-reflective. Uh, he said it was an interesting experience, uh, but he wouldn't want to do it again. So, it's, yeah, you have these, these folks that just cut themselves off completely from society, literally go live up a mountain and uh, just cut themselves off from everything. Very strange in this day and age, but... There's a good, actually a really good documentary about the Russian Orthodox Church on YouTube, if you search for it. And it's a bunch of young guys. These guys are like in their 30s. And they're Eastern Orthodox monks. And they're more or less completely cut off from society, but they still have to go in town and get stuff. And it just, you can see this contrast between like modern Russia after the fall of the Iron Curtain and these, you know, very devout, very young men who choose to become monks. And it's just very strange to see the juxtaposition of that monastic life against modern life in uh, Russia. It's really strange. They look like neat guys. They look like they'd be fun to talk to. But it's just a strange way of life in the modern age. And yes, they do have Wi-Fi, so I don't know how well they really are cut off. If you do a search for it, it is pretty interesting. And it's just neat to see. It's a very beautiful country. Uh, so enough about that. Uh, article 15 is the last article on human traditions. The declaration of the papists that human traditions serve for the forgiveness of sins or merit salvation is unchristian and condemned. As Christ says, in vain do they worship me, teaching his doctrines the commandments of men. Again, the commands of people who turn away from the truth. When they declare that it is a mortal sin if someone breaks these ordinances, this too is not right. These are the articles on which I must stand and, God willing, shall stand even to my death. I do not know how to change or yield anything in them. If anyone wants to yield anything, let him do it at the peril of his conscience. Finally, there still remains the Pope's bag of tricks about foolish and childish articles, such as the dedication of churches, the baptism of bells, the baptism of the altar stone, and the inviting of sponsors to these rites who would make donations toward them. Such baptizing is a mockery and scorning of holy baptism, and so should not be tolerated. Furthermore, concerning the consecration of wax candles, palm branches, cakes, oats, spices, and such, these cannot be called consecrations, but are sheer mockery and fraud. Such tricks are without number. We commend them for adoration to their God and to themselves until they weary of it. We will have nothing to do with them. And then the remainder of the small called articles is a list of all the signatories, the very first being Martin Luther. And then there's a list of about 43 fellows here, uh, Lutheran ministers, uh, professors at the university, and so forth. And that is the end of the Small Called Articles, which again was Luther's last real big writing, and it's his last confession of faith. He thought this was going to be the last time before he died uh, that he would get a chance to write out from beginning to end all of his articles of the faith. So tomorrow evening we will begin... The Augsburg Confession, it'll start fast. We'll do several, quite a few articles uh, in each evening because they're very short, because they're the articles that we're not really disagreeing with people on. And then they'll get longer. 
I don't think by the time we get to the end, we'll only be doing one article an evening because they get uh, pretty wordy. And after that, we'll do the apology to the Augsburg Confession, which just stretches everything out more into more detail. So you will really know by the time we review the Augsburg Confession and its apology, we'll have a really good refresher course on the Christian faith. And then to wrap it up, we will do the uh, Formula of Concord at the very end. And so we'll be a couple, three months uh, going through all of that stuff. And now we join in the Apostles' Creed in the Lord's Prayer. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, merciful and holy Bridegroom, we grieve the fall of your church. It is our fault that the beauty of your bride is no longer recognized. Therefore we pray you, give and increase in us faith, love, and hope in you. Root out of us all sins and vice, all strife, all disbelief, all error and heresy. Rebuke the erring, convert the unbelievers. Bring the rebellious again to the unity of the Christian church, and show them the light of your truth. Protect our shepherd from all danger of body and soul. Bless all pastors and those who administer in the church in the building of your congregation. Grant them success in all things. Equip your whole church with the power and proof of the holy faith. Stand by your witnesses among the nations and further the course of your gospel in all the world. Fill all government with the fear of you and let their ruling serve to foster and preserve peace. Have mercy on our people and our country. Let the youth be brought up in discipline and in a right knowledge of you, so that they may recognize your law and the way of your salvation. Give constancy and loyalty to all pious teachers. Comfort all the troubled and sorrowful. Impart health of body and soul to the sick. Grant to all pregnant women, according to your mercy, a happy result in their childbearing. To the needy, give bodily and spiritually according to your good pleasure. Let those who travel be commended to the protection of your holy angels and be a strong help to all who need you. For the sake of your holy wounds, O Jesus. Amen. Lord God, Heavenly Father, through the prophet Elijah, you continued the prophetic pattern of teaching your people the true faith and demonstrating through miracles your presence in creation to heal it of its brokenness. Grant that your church may see in your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, the final end times prophet, whose teachings and miracles continue in your church through the healing medicine of the gospel and the sacraments. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good night.